Hi, this is Charles Maxwood, and I've been asked more times than I can count, how do I stay current? There's a lot to this question, and I'm working on a solution, code badges. That's right, you heard me right. Basically, the idea is, is that you come and do a code badge, and that gets you an introduction to a topic. Then you can decide if you want to pursue it further. But while working on the badge, you gain enough proficiency to be able to pick it up again if you need. A lot of technology comes through on the bleeding edge, and not all of it sticks, but the principles do. So doing badges on the technologies that will get you ahead will provide you with experience needed to stay competitive. Plus, it offers social proof that you know something about the topic. The project is on Kickstarter right now. You can support it and get on the launch list at codebadge.org. Hey, everybody, and welcome to my JavaScript story. This week, we're talking to Michael Garrigan. Did I say that right? Yeah, that's right. And uh, just what was that? I said it's a good Irish name. There you go. Now, just to give you all a little bit of background, I initially started this show out by interviewing people who had been guests on our other shows, so on JavaScript Jabber and things like that. And I decided to open it up to listeners because I feel like we're missing out on some of the stories out there. So uh, Michael jumped on and scheduled a uh, an interview. And so we're going to just be talking about his experience and we'll just see where this winds up. Uh, we talked a little bit before the show about uh, him going to a boot camp. So that should give you some idea uh, about where he is and what his experience is. But I find that the experience for developers kind of evolves over time. And so his experience is going to be different from mine and different from so- some of our other guests. So that's a little bit more of a preface, I guess, than you're, you're used to getting. But I just want to let you all know that we are still going to be getting guests from JavaScript Jabber onto my JavaScript story, but I really do want to open this up so that it's more of a, a well-rounded look into what the JavaScript community is doing. So anyway, Michael, do you want to introduce yourself really quickly and then we'll jump in and we'll start talking about your story and where you came from and, and all that good stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I guess this will be a good chance for some people that are Used to hearing people that have experience so many years in the industry. And I really came to this, you know, if I go back one year from now, I knew zero about programming, uh, programming languages, how they work, anything about Linux, operating systems. So mm-hmm. my experience is, is sort of a mid-career change. And so it uh, maybe give people some insight into what it's like today to look at the industry from coming from zero and to see some of the things that are intimidating, some of the things that are exciting, and some things that are just confusing. Yeah, I'm really curious to dive into this as well. To get us started, how did you get into programming? Yeah, so this started out uh, about a year back with the simple question of how do humans talk to machines and tell them what they want them to do? And so without any sort of background, I sort of started looking at, well, what are the different uh, computer languages out there? What are they good for? Which applications do people prefer to use them? And pretty much everything I read pointed to uh, the C programming language as being the grandfather sort of Mm -hmm. syntactically to a lot of what's out there now. So that's actually what I picked as the first thing to look at. (laughs) And like a lot of people, I got up to addresses and pointers and started being like, what is going on? Like from not knowing what a variable is to picking up the, I actually got the, a copy of the the original K and R second version book and started working through that. And I was, I've never been more happy in my life than when I got a, <laughs> a simple temperature conversion program that just turned Fahrenheit to Celsius on a command line to actually run. It took me about a month to figure out how to set up an environment, make the files, and actually do all that work. Just to do a very simple program, was I was thrilled to death that any output came back out. Oh, wow. Yeah, I did some C in college because uh, I was a computer engineering major. And so we we did a lot of work that was closer to the metal. And uh, yeah, uh, the the Java that I was learning then and, you know, Ruby and JavaScript since then, it, 
it's a little less complicated because you don't have to deal with some of those things at the level that you do with C. So how did you wind up coming around to JavaScript then? Yeah, so this was a the thing that I... Well, JavaScript is just so easy. I mean, you can open up a console and just start mm-hmm. whacking uh, commands in there. And you can see output. And uh, the web is just so nice to be able to see things. Like when you start developing, you just want to see things happen visually. And to, to do a small amount of HTML and CSS and to see colors and shapes and rectangles move around, you know, JavaScript is just a, a great entry point. Yeah. So I kind of hooked onto that and then we start building things in uh in React and and seeing how fun that is. And uh yeah, it's just I, I really enjoy JavaScript in general. Makes sense. I'm I'm a little bit curious. You mentioned that you are kind of doing a career transition. Uh yeah. what does that look like and what are you coming from into programming? Yeah, so I've kind of stepped through a couple uh phases. I've always been a, a craftsman, so I've always done building things. Mm -hmm. I had a a portion of time I worked as a professional chef, uh, mainly in the the garmage side of the kitchen, which is the cold side. And we would make uh, cheeses, we would make um, uh, sausages and meats, Uh, we would uh, do pâtés and terrines and such. And and I used to do a lot of uh, ice carvings as well. But that sounds interesting. Then I stopped that and I opened a small business in Pennsylvania where I uh, repaired antique furniture for pe- for people. So I was a uh, a weaver and I would do um, caning and rush and wicker restoration, which was, uh, in my eyes, it was, it was super cool because I, everything that people brought me was a hundred years old and you got to see stuff that these people a hundred years ago, what would happen is you'd be 13, 14 years old and you would go apprentice for somebody and that's what you would do all your life. You, you carved carousel horses and that's what you were good at and that's what you right. did. And you did it really well. And to see what people did very well and to be able to touch that was was very enjoyable. So yeah, then it became a, no, no, just something that every so many years, I just want to learn why something else works and, and uh, mm-hmm. get my hands in it. So this just happened to be, I actually got a, a Linux operating system hooked up on an old Dell computer. And that was kind of did like Cinnamon Mint and then started getting into Arch Linux. And that was kind of the gateway to things uh, from the terminal being a scary little box to uh, something that was fun to, to put commands in and make programs and to be able to touch every single file inside an operating system is is great. Yeah, that's somewhat how I got into things. I mean, for me, I did take some classes in college to to learn how to code. But yeah, I was, I was working in IT. And I wound up actually writing a system that helped, you know, manage updates across multiple servers in bash. And yeah, it, it went from there to Oh, this is kind of fun that there's some automation that I can do here and, you know, grew into something else. So yeah, really, really interesting there. So, so why did you decide to, to switch? I mean, was it just, oh, I'm playing with this Linux stuff and it's fun? Or were you looking for something maybe a little more lucrative or what, just a new challenge? I, I mean, it sounds like there might be multiple reasons for that. Yeah, I guess it's uh, the main motivation is just that I, I just enjoy the logic behind it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's so different to, like I said, I always built items, objects, uh, physical items. Right. And so to build items that are non-physical is just, you know, I spend 10 hours writing a, a, an application or something. Mm-hmm. And what I've done is I've essentially assembled logic together in the form of binary that sits on a drive somewhere and just is held in state by electricity. And it's such a, a bizarre kind of idea. But just just using logic to essentially put out a giant instruction sheet is just very interesting and fun. Yeah, absolutely. So you get into this, you start playing with Linux, you start playing with JavaScript. At what point do you start thinking, okay, maybe I want to go do a boot camp? Yeah, so I I, uh, I, I played around with the Linux long enough and, and chatted with my wife. And I was like, well, maybe I'll do this as a career. And she was like, well, go go to one of these campuses, talk to some people. 
and see if this is actually something that because things become different between a hobby level and right. doing it, going into work and doing it. Things change. They stop being fun and they start being work. So yep. it's uh but I enjoyed it to the point where I was like, yeah, I could I could see myself getting up every day and going to meetings and talking about what uh, what tickets were on the board and, and digging out bugs and writing out some readmes and, you know, and just coding day to day. So it, right. interesting. So you went, who did you talk to? Where did, where did you go talk to people? Was it at Hack Reactor? Was it somewhere else? Yeah, initially, uh, well, of course, the first step, you read a bunch of stuff online. Um, I had a, a, a few friends uh, that worked for Dripe out in okay. California but they did a lot of like DevOps kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so their advice was kind of like, yeah, you can do a bootcamp or whatever, but don't really focus on a language. Just get the basics behind programming because languages come and go and you, you may not even take a job doing the language that you initially picked up anyway. So just be able to learn quickly and, and uh, learn the basic behind uh, loops and recursion and uh, classes and, constructors and all that sort of stuff so but yeah so i went out to uh, uh hack reactor it was from everything i read it was one of the better schools and mm -hmm. uh, they opened up um this new york campus somewhat recently and so yeah i went by and everybody was was great and so i worked for another six months just socking away cash because it stopped midlife and to pay for school and pay to live somewhere while not working is takes a little bit of planning. Yeah. <laughs> well, in, in New York, is it in New York city or is it? Yeah. It's right. In, uh, right in midtown. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if you commute in, but it's also fairly expensive to live there. So. Yeah. No, everything's uh very pricey, especially, you know, I have a home in Pennsylvania that's paid for and mm -hmm. it's uh, a world of difference. I mean, the cost of living is just so much greater. Yep, absolutely. So what was it like going to a boot camp? And, you know, what what were your expectations going in? Yeah, so I uh, pretty much, they, they kind of pride themselves on being an immersive program. So I expected to work hard and stay late and to do all those sort of things, mm -hmm. which of course you do. And you get the stress of deadlines, you know, a lot of the, <laughs> stuff in the beginning is only like two day sprints or three day sprints. And so you're trying to turn out this code in only, you know, just X amount of hours and actually stand up in front of the class and present it to people. And so, you know, they, it's intentional that they add the stress in there to, to show you what real life is. Right. Um, so I was a little bit different in the course being uh, a couple of years more senior than a lot of the people in the early twenties in the mm -hmm. course um, where I've had work history. I've, I've had to hire people and, and let people go. Right. And so, and I've also stayed and dealed with customers and complaints. And so I have a little more background, but, but yeah, the first half is just a lot of theory. Uh, you're going through different concepts and ideas that you've never tried and opening up databases and connecting to them and writing servers and you know, the front end fr frameworks and uh -huh. a lot of data structure stuff, which is interesting and very, uh, can be very difficult to, to try to optimize solutions and to find data very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of that sort of work. And then the second half is based around uh, pairing off into groups. They give you some more autonomy and you uh, just start dealing with the group dynamic and merge conflicts mm -hmm. and who's naturally a leader and followers. And yeah, and then that's it. You snap your fingers and it's done. Is your job search stuck? Maybe you're not getting any interviews with employers, or maybe you are, but no job offers. Or you may be new and not even know where to start. This is Charles Maxwood, and I'm releasing a new course and ebook on how to find a job as a software developer. The course walks you through the process of finding the types of companies you want to work for, getting their attention, and putting your best foot forward as the candidate they want. I've coached dozens of developers in looking for jobs and have been able to help several people find jobs within two weeks to two months. So whether you're new to development, can't find a great job that fits what you want, or are looking for remote work from an area without a strong tech community, I can help. Go to getacoderjob.com and sign up today. Cool. So uh, what, what sorts of projects have you built as part of 
your learning process? I have a handful of different ones. Uh, so one was kind of like a clone of eBay, which exposed just a lot of the the complexity of, of setting up an environment for buyers to come in and sellers. And we wrapped all that up into AWS mm-hmm. and ran stuff in separate uh, Lambda functions so that certain parts could scale well and, and made uh, read and write databases uh, for efficiency and put load balancers in and right. a lot of this sort of stuff. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's never ceases to amaze me on something that a simple, I say simple project like that, just allowing people to buy and sell something on an application mm-hmm. and to be able to log in just how many components and, and routes are involved and just, the folders just pile up everywhere. <laughs> Start figuring out like, okay, you know, how are we going to organize all this stuff? And um, so I did that one. I did uh, a thing working with the, the census.gov API, which is massive, but yep. they have a lot of population and density and employment stuff and built some, uh, like a chart building application that works with D3. And, uh, mm-hmm. That sort of stuff is fun to see all the the bubble charts and area charts and things that you can click on and so stuff like that uh, and various other smaller ones like things like uh, just using different APIs with YouTube and uh, one for searching out doctors and putting it onto a map with little pins and oh nice you know very yeah. cool yeah we did a, a fun one where it was a uh, a group head. They set up a project so that it was a, a legacy. So you would inherit a batch of another group's code, and then you would build on some functionality on top of that. <laughs> and so that was a good uh, dive into not just starting with the blank sheet of paper, which is starts to become preferable. And you start right. looking at the, what what's coming into this function. Like, why are they doing it this way? And like, to so that was a fun one because it was a a programmer, you could select a mood. So say I was excited that day or I wanted to watch a tearjerker and it would bring up movies based on that. Ah, so, gotcha. So I extended the functionality to to also build out like web scrapers that would run out and find articles if somebody would write an article on tearjerker books or plays or songs. And so we kind of extended it to lots of other media. So now this application will recommend to you songs that are sad and plays that you should go watch it that are sad. And so it's fun. There's, you're always kind of learning new things when you build out these projects. Right. What are you working on now? Well, now I just uh, working on getting a job. Mm-hmm. So we just uh, did graduation on Friday. I put together a, uh, a quick portfolio page that just kind of encapsulates all the other projects and I was actually just this morning trying to get AWS to, they tell you that it's super easy. You can migrate a, a SQL database into their Aurora database mm-hmm. and snap of the fingers. And I tried so many different ways to, to get that to work, doing a MySQL dump and using these couple other programs to, to, to create a snapshot or a, a clone of my database and bring it in. Mm-hmm. And I finally got the, the last one to work. And then they said, well, it's, it'll be $120 for this service for us to migrate this for you. <laughs> and I said, I'm not, I'm not paying you guys $120 to, to right. migrate essentially a toy application database, which is very small. Yep. Um, over. So, so yeah, uh, I'm just was recreating that database onto my instance. And, uh, yeah, and they'll just be uh, hitting the meetups and hitting the uh, uh, interview process and whiteboarding and all that. Get the first job in the industry. Sounds good. I'm a little curious where you're at. What, what do you feel like is the biggest obstacle to you getting where you want to be? I'm not really sure there is a, a, a biggest obstacle. Um, I've, I've done large projects in the past. I've... Uh, I've I've done diff- very difficult things in the past and mm-hmm. seen that I can do them just through sheer amount of work that I've put in. So I kind of know that that it will happen. It's just a matter of of time. Right. So yeah, I'm not I'm not really too concerned. I guess the biggest thing going in being like around mid 30s 
uh, was any sort of bias that may be out there. But when I look around, I, I'm not really sure that that's going to play into it. Yeah, I've talked to a bunch of people who are sort of at the stage that you're at. And I have seen age bias, but it usually doesn't come in until people are, you know, in their 50s or 60s and yeah. making the career transition. I've seen, I've seen that play out more often than anything in, you know, for people in their 20s or 30s or even early 40s. So but yeah, it's um just that I've always ultimately been very good at whatever I choose to do. So I don't expect anything different here. Right. Um, the only thing I'm not looking forward to is there's a, a term in culinary called making your bones. I don't mm. know if you've ever heard that term, but no, not really. You know, if, if you were to tell me that you made your bones in broadcasting, it would mean that you put in the hours in the beginning uh -huh. and did the schlep work in the beginning to become a professional at it. Right. Um, and so I've transitioned several times to different industries and each time I've had to make my bones and start at the bottom and put in yeah. the time and the schlep work. So not really looking forward to it at this point, but it, it always has to be done in order for somebody else to look at you and call you a professional someday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. So do you have any other things going on or anything else you want to talk about before we uh, start heading toward wrapping up? I'm pretty much doing all these different meetups coming up. So I'm pretty psyched because yeah. New York is just full of them. Oh, yeah. So I got an Emacs uh, group tonight. So I'm going to put the Vim sticker on my uh, laptop and go to the the Emacs meetup. <laughs> and, uh, and then I have a Lisp one tomorrow, a Lisp group. Oh, nice. I don't really know very much at all about Lisp, but other than the very basics. But yeah, and then there's just, yeah, every day is something different. Uh, the one after that, there's uh, one of the, the main people doing uh, Postgres 11. They're going to start talking about what's new in that. And so I kind of purposely put myself into all these eclectic mm -hmm. groups and just to get out there and start meeting people in the industry and see where it goes. Yeah, that is definitely the way to go. I've been working on this book and video course on how to find a job. And yeah, that's, that's what I tell people is essentially build up your portfolio and go to the meetups and, and meet people and talk to them. Uh, yeah. I also uh, got a chance to hear uh, Kevin Griffin uh, when you had him on and he was really well-spoken and I, I enjoyed his, I did something that was very similar to his talk a lot about financial, financial common sense, uh, spending money wisely sort of a thing. And I'm pretty sure he uses uh, David Ramsey's uh -huh. materials and courses. And um, yeah, so a number of years ago, I, I went through that and paid off my home and zeroed out any debt that I had. And it's such a great feeling to be able to just not owe anybody in the world anything. There's a big reason why I could change careers. Yep. Uh, because I, I didn't have that weight sitting on me. Yeah, I was going to say, that's got to be easier if you don't have a house payment or whatever to make. Yeah, you can truly just uh, do things that you, you wish to rather than, man, I, I can't leave this job because i got to make the car payment. And, yep. Yeah, so. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, it's it's funny that you mentioned that because I've been thinking a lot about what I want devchat.tv to be. And the mission statement that I came up with was essentially to liberate developers so that they can go build uh, cutting edge and or cutting edge software that matters. And, you know, that that's one of the things is getting out of debt. It opens you up to be able to go decide where you want to be, even if it's not the most lucrative job you can find. It, it's something that matches up with what you want and what fulfills you. And it's a big deal. Oh, it's huge. Yeah, it's... um. Because a lot of people, uh, you know, in the past literature, it's, it's a lot of times referred to being analogous to slavery, to be to have debt to somebody. Yep. Essentially, you're forced to do something that you maybe don't want to do in order to repay uh, a situation. And it's, yeah, really just, just freeing. And it feels, you think about it at the time before when you're still in debt and you're like, well, what difference is it going to make? I'm still going to be the same person. Mm-hmm. But it really is this thing that just, it's sitting back there in your head and you don't even fully realize it until it's gone. And then you're like, wow, your outlook is so different. 
yeah, my wife and I are going to be out of debt by the end of the year. And yeah, it's just the anticipation is, it's just like, we're, you know, we're going to be free. Yeah. And it, it is, it's a big deal. So. Yeah. Congratulations. It's a, it's a lot of hard work. I, you know, yeah, it is. <laughs> it's like you, pretty much everybody can do it, but you just have to have that discipline and, and to not spend money in certain circumstances. And it's yeah. hard peer pressure and all those sorts of things. Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and do some picks. I've got another interview coming up in about 15 minutes. So yeah, absolutely. you have some things you want to shout out about? Deploy more, pay less with DigitalOcean, the simplest all-in-one cloud computing platform for developers. Scale and run cloud applications faster and more efficiently with effortless administration tools to robust compute flexible configurations, networking services, real-time alerts, and rapid provisioning while enjoying industry-leading price to performance with a flat pricing structure across all global data center regions at any usage volume. Spend more time building better web apps and less time worrying about managing infrastructure with DigitalOcean. Build your next app on DigitalOcean. Get started with a free $100 credit at do.co slash jabber. Wow, I didn't actually... uh prepare anything so focused on uh this course that's essentially sucked away all my free time Mm -hmm. but um one of the the people i think is doing such a good job out there is uh brad traversy at traversy media he is a youtube uh programming channel and i think he's up to close to like a half a million uh subscribers and he started out as just an independent dev guy just building websites for people and has made this little mini empire for himself and uh is is doing very well but it's just it's so great to hear him uh to teach how to make something in react and and all this stuff is just free he just keeps pumping out material and uh i just love him awesome so what tools do they make you use in uh hack reactor you mentioned vim do they teach you vim or do they teach you something else uh, no, as far as editors, um, pretty much everybody settled on uh, VS Code. Mm-hmm. There's a few people that went with Atom, but for the most part, it's uh, Vim is a little more, I don't want to say nerdy, but it's a little more Linuxy. It's a little more yeah. DevOps kind of thing. But yeah, pretty much everything's uh, just understanding your basic Git workflow using VS Code. Yeah, those are kind of the basic uh, the basic tools. Yeah, I personally really, really love VS Code and I use it for all of my stuff, which is funny because I used Emacs forever. And so I just installed the Emacs key bindings plugin and that worked great for me. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, the only thing that uh, gets me with the VS Code is just those pop ups all the time that are, are trying to auto suggest and be very helpful, but they're just uh, a lot of times just covering over the code that I actually want to look at four lines above. And, uh, sometimes can be just a pain. Yep. Makes sense. All right. Well, I'm going to jump in here and pick a few things. The first one that I'm going to pick is there's a TV show on TNT called The Last Ship. And uh, my wife has been watching it for a while. My wife and I have. Um, And it's just one of the things, you know, we'll watch a TV show or play a game together or something. Um, We usually do something together every night. So or most nights. So anyway, it's it's been nice. So I'm going to pick that. Another pick that I have, and this is a board game, it's uh, Pandemic Legacy. Um, apparently there are two seasons out now. So they released the, the original Pandemic Legacy, which is based on the Pandemic board game. And uh, my wife and I go play it with some good friends of ours every Monday night. And so we're just about to finish it up. It's one of those games where you play progressive games. And then at the end of the game, you, you have to throw it out because it, you know, you can't, started over or anything but anyway it's it's been a lot of fun so i'm going to pick that and then on the programming front i just want to shout out by the time this goes out i think we're going to be well into the kickstarter but uh, i'm doing a kickstarter for a program called code badges and the idea is is that people can get badges that represent where they're at in their uh, learning journey on particular technologies and anyway so i it came out of a lot of people asking me how do i stay current and, you know, ultimately I tell them, well, why do you want to stay current? You know, figure out what you, where you want to wind up and then, and then go figure it out. But once they figure that out, I wanted a place where I could put up links to good tutorials or 
allow people to link out to GitHub repos where they've done work. So for example, if people are working with the Facebook API or something, right? You know, they can link out to an app where they pulled data from the Facebook API and push data back in or something like that. Or, you know, Webpack. So if you've written your own Webpack config from scratch for a project, you know, you can link to it if you want. Or you can just go in and say, hey, I've done this and this is the web the Webpack setup that I've done or React. You know, here's an app that I built with React. And so then newer folks can go out and they can say, see, this is what I've done with React. And here's the badge that I have that says that I'm proficient with React. However, we measure that. And I'm still figuring some of that out. Um, I'm talking to some, some learning expert people. Anyway, you can go support the project on, at codebadge.org. And the idea, again, is just then you can put the badges up on your website and things like that and show off what you've done. But it, it's also, again, kind of a guided tour. If you want the two-hour, spend a little bit of time becoming familiar with something, or the several hour I've built a project with this, you get different badges for that. And then I also want to open it up to projects so that they can give out contributor badges and conferences to attendee badges or speaker badges or things like that. So anyway, so that's what I'm working on these days and really enjoying that. Incidentally, people have asked a little bit what I'm writing it in. The back end is in Elixir, Phoenix, and the front end is going to be in Vue. So if you're interested in that, go check those out. And I picked Vue because I've been having a really good time uh, learning it and talking to uh, people on the Views on Vue podcast. So anyway, it's been fun. Uh, one last thing. Where do people find you online, Michael? Yeah, uh, michaelgarrigan.com. That's uh, my portfolio and has links to everything else. And that's kind of will be uh, the main starting point. And it was, right. it was also uh, super refreshing to make a... Uh, I just decided to make that as a, a basic HTML page that links mm -hmm. to CSS. And it was so fun not to be, just to not have the Babel RC and the Webpack config yeah. and all these build tools. And it felt very early 90s, just make an HTML page and link it to a CSS and throw it out there. You need to put a marquee tab in it, a tag in it though. Yeah. In the early 90s. Anyway, fun stuff. All right, cool. Well, let, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you for coming and talking to me. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I really enjoy... Uh, I listened to you for a while now. I think you're doing a great job out there. Oh, well, thanks. I appreciate that. Building a community. And um, this whole streak is uh, along with the open source and just this uh, sort of free information that just keeps getting pumped out there is uh, it's exciting. And I appreciate the work that you're putting in. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. Okay. All right. Well, we will wrap this up and we'll come back next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.